Well, good morning, and if you have your Bible, turn to uh, Hosea, in the Old Testament, Hosea chapter 1, we'll be reading verses 6 through 9 this morning, 6 through 9. And I'm reading from the NIV this morning. Hosea 1, 6 reads, Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call her a low ru'amah, which means not loved. For I will no longer show love to Israel that I should at all forgive them. And yet I will show love to Judah and will save them, not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horses and horsemen, but I, the Lord their God, will save them. And after she had weaned Lu, uh, Lo Ruamah, Gomer had another son. And then the Lord said to call him Lo Ami, which means not my people. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. Strong words, and we are now introduced to two more children. Uh, I do want to remind you just very quickly that Hosea, uh, the, this Old Testament prophet, is... Uh, is a, is a book of interesting things. And so if you will keep this in mind, that chapters one, which we're in, two and three basically are a uh, broad statement of the facts. In other words, the one chapter one, two, and three, which we haven't read all of it, but that is a basically an overview or a, a broad statement that Hosea is making about uh, what's going on. In chapters four through 14, which is the rest of Hosea, are going to be details. So if you're, we try to give you some background, a few things, and if you're seeking details, don't worry because the prophecies in 4 through 14, the chapters 4 through 14, are going to be details about these names and about what it means and how that's going to play out. And so we'll get into the details Hosea does as he gets into chapter 4. So these first uh, three chapters, though, give us the idea. That's why it seems like after you've read a, a chapter, even one or two, you've, you've, especially chapter one, you get the idea, okay, what else is there to say? Uh, but obviously uh, there is much to say and there are details and we always want details. It, uh, none of us are very satisfied with, the, with broad statements. And uh, even though that might be enough, if God said, you know, I mean, Lord, you're God, you have no other gods before me, great, done. Easy to understand, no other gods before me. But somehow or other, that somehow is not enough. So people want that explained and God gives ample examples. And here in Hosea, he's going to, he's making these big statements, uh, but he's going to go into details about that. Uh, he gives uh, these names, by the way, all three of them. We've heard Jezreel, Lo uh, Ru Ama, and Lo Ami. These three children, these names all are stages of judgment about uh, that God's going to carry out through these people. He's going to, uh, he's declaring a judgment in the 8th century BC against the people of Israel. And of course, it's going to be against the people of Judah too. Uh, and we'll talk about that as we go along. But this is, this is a picture. If you want to jump immediately to some sort of how, what, what is he trying to say? This is a picture of a progressive drift away from God and it all it applies at any age or any time that this uh, kind of progressive drift and I'm not using that word progressive in the sense that today that you know there's this political group and that group and that and progressive uh, it's a, that the, any name any proper name comes from a some more common name and a common word and it gives it some sort of formality but in this case it's a it's a drift it's a, just like if you're driving down the road and there's one thing to sharply turn your steering wheel and suddenly try to make a 90 degree turn at, and you're going this way and then suddenly you're going that way. But a drift is kind of like what happens when you are not paying attention or you are, and if you don't, if your car has a tendency to tra follow tracks in the road and things like that, they all seem to do. It kind of slowly drifts one way or the other, depending on uh, the surface and all that kind of stuff. So there's a slow kind of thing. And that one thing about drift is it's very dangerous because it, 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 you don't realize you have gotten off the path sometimes uh, and, uh, right away. And that's one thing about that. Okay, so this is it. It's certainly true of any age in our age that we're living in now, 21st century here. Uh, 
uh, is true. And it's, it's, it's true of all ages and times. So Hosea's message, and I keep saying this because the Old Testament prophets and Old Testament stuff is, well, it's old. You know, that's what people, eh, what does that got to do with anything? Uh, it got a lot to do with it because it gives us a picture of how this works and how it happens and what God, how God deals with it. And so that we hopefully can do like anything else, experience of others could benefit us. If we take, listen to it carefully and pay attention to it and make uh, the necessary adjustments uh, that are required. Each child is, as I said, is a stage of judgment. So we've already met one. That was last week. We met um, Jezreel. Each one of these, re and the purpose of these stages, these kind of steps, if you will, in the judgment, leading up to judgment, the purpose is always, let me hear me well here, the purpose of God's judgment is always an effort to cause us to reflect and repent. God's always judgment is always about bringing about a reflection. What does that mean? Well, a thinking about what's going on. What, what do I, what's, what, wait, am I in this? Is this me? Am I doing this? Is this happening? And then uh, the realization that we are part of that. We've made some, some sort of, we've, had, we've fallen into this somehow or other, uh, maybe to a lesser or greater degree, and then to repent. It's always to repent because repentance leads to forgiveness and that leads to uh, God's uh, mercy and grace and things that, that bring us out of that and gets us back on the right track. So always, I'll mark that down, you mark it down any way you want to, remember it, God is always, about his judgment is not vindictive, it is always with an effort. Just like parents are correcting their children to uh, the, an I, the ideal such situation, a parent corrects their children to uh, prevent, cause a child to stop and then to change whatever they're doing because they parents have sensed in some actual or perceived or uh, situation that's dangerous and uh, counterproductive to the child. And of course, children don't always follow that and don't always listen to it and all that, just like us. So there it is. Now, last week we met Jezreel. Jezreel, uh, in the name, and I might have mentioned or might not, let me mention again, there's two meanings of the name Jezreel. And it's interesting that the two meanings are exactly what God wanted. That exactly why he chose this name for this person. I won't go back and preach that sermon, but I want to make a note of it. His name means God sows and also God scatters. Now, why, why, how could that be? How, how could that be? Well, if you remember, the people of that day sowed, when they sowed seeds, they generally scattered them. It was generally a broadcast thing, so they're scattered. So at the same time, they're sowing. Uh, with the idea of, you know, purposeful uh, getting something done. And then there's this idea of scattering, which which is uh, which kind of sounds like the, the opposite of that, which is purpose. And it was a warning in, in stage one of the judgment is always a warning. There's a warning. He was warning them that the same God who sows is the same God who scatters. When he talked about Jezreel and how and the meaning of Jezreel and this. Uh, battle and he used this valley and he used all these uh, pictures of things that happen and he mentioned Jehu and all that kind of stuff he's going to break their bow that God who sowed them in this land and gave them their purpose and, and, and place in the land is also the God who can scatter them out so the same God that brings salvation is the God who can also grant you the, your other requests uh, the opposite of that which is not to be saved and for eternal damnation and so on. So he is telling us, remember what happened. That's why I come. He pointed out some some stuff uh, that uh, he mentioned had already happened. And he also mentioned some future events. So he gives some future. This is going to happen. This did happen. And this is going to happen. And here's why. Because of this judgment. So stage one is a warning. Now it leaves us with stage two. So now we find in verse six, this first child's name, uh, this female child, her name's Lu, uh, Lo, I keep saying Lu, Lo Ru Ama, meaning not love. So the stage after uh, this warning is this not love stage. Okay, so what, is, what does that mean? Not love. Well, not loved, right? Uh, it seems like the words come, this word, these words, these names, uh, Israelite names, Hebrew names always have meanings and, and they're made up of other words, just like a lot of things are. And, so this this idea of a child coming from the womb, uh, this love by their parents and and uh, and all that. So 
this is uh, this is the idea that says God says, okay, so you didn't heed the warning. So this is stage two. So first was the warning, no heeding the warning. Next thing happens is I don't love you. I'm not going to love you. And what does that look like? Uh, basically, uh, quickly, I will get to that and say this. So you get what you want. I'll give you what you want. Okay. Every parent who's been a parent, who's been around kids, or even is a child and grown up enough, you got smart enough to realize that I think anybody can get this. Maybe my illustration is not as good as they should be, but I'll say this, that, that, that the love of a parent, uh, is uh, the idea is that the parent is not giving you what you want because some of the things you want uh, are dangerous and deadly and have bad consequences. So parents who love their children are going to do things and prevent that and block and try to help them. And even if the children do not agree, I think we could all say that children generally do not always agree with what parents consider to be dangerous and things and when parents are blocking that in some way or or in their mind they're loving the children because they're protecting them the child is resisting and kicking and so at some point uh it you know and i think in practical sense as much as you can without you know creating too big of a problem you give them what they want okay if you don't believe me then experience may teach you keep your hand away from the stove that's Okay. Don't play with fire. Don't do this. Don't run in the house. I've got a scar that reminds me not to run in the house when I was probably not that about that about you can't see. So from here down to here, about that tall, about the height of a dresser in the old days, I ran through the house from my mom because I had done something I wasn't supposed to do already, and she's chasing me literally through the house, and I'm running, and I look back to see. Who was looking back to see? Oh, that's the song. Never mind. I was looking back to see where she was. And as I turned around, I had encountered the corner of one of those very sharp dresser tops. And it lashed a, a gash across my eyebrow right there. And of course, you know, anytime you touch your head and cut it, no matter who you are, it believes like you're dying. And of course, that, there was a big, you know, there it is. So I have a reminder of that. But God gives us what we want. We don't like to think of that. We don't really think of that that way. What is it that we really want? If you, you know, there's a lot of things and everybody's got their individual stuff. Uh, lots of things like that. Well, you know, I mentioned briefly that, you know, the fire, playing with fire. So yeah, don't put your hand on the stove. Well, I wasn't really quite, uh, you know, up to that. What I was more fascinated was with the gas fire that burned in the stove. So I reached in the garbage can and got a piece of paper one day and stuck it up there to catch the paper on fire. I hadn't thought far enough ahead being, you know, child and, and I hadn't thought far enough ahead of what I was going to do with the paper when it started burning, kind of like holding a match and going, uh oh, right? So I just threw it back in the garbage can, which then lit on fire and melted and burned and caused a fire, and it was a big problem. And needless to say, I'm alive. No house was burned down. No animals were hurt. However, um, I did pay some consequences for that one. Um, that I, there's probably no scars, but you know, I remember it, obviously, right? So understand this these are warnings. This is the show love. But when a parent uh, purposely or without their purpose, but because of circumstances, cannot do that. And you get to do it. You get what you want. I think we all, at least grown ups, have gotten far enough along the line to know that if we really stop and thought about it, whether we admit it or not, there are a lot of things we wanted that we're glad we didn't get. And a lot of things we wanted that we got that we wish he hadn't got. And so that's what it means. So what does that look like in general that we can all kind of put in more general? I think it's one to live independent of God. See, these people had worshipped false gods. They were worshipping false gods and uh, these Baal gods and mixing it in with their other stuff. And, you know, they were going down to the temple and giving their stuff and doing the things and putting them and cutting the sheep throat and doing all the stuff. But they were also worshipping the Baals. The, the, that's the general name for the false gods of the people they lived among. They had mixed those in. They had taken up this other eyed thing, and so they had created these. So what they really wanted to do is they really just wanted to live independent of God. They just didn't want to do it. So these are people who come to church, come to services, participate to some level or at least attend, and change nothing. They they still worship other things. 
They still have other idols in their life. They still think it's okay to uh, for abortion. They still think it's okay to be uh, some uh, deny your sexuality as your DNA and your chromosome sexuality and be something else. They think that's okay. They think a lot of things are. I pick two easy ones. There are lots of things they think are okay, uh, and they 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 want to do it their way. Is the same, you know, the old song, right? So this is this is independent of God. It's not to say that they, you know, are they're they're willing to come down and participate to some level, but that at some point, if, if there's too much pressure to, you have to clear those off your table, then they're bailed. They'll find some place, and there are plenty of places, plenty of places they call worship services, churches, buildings, and groups of people who claim to be worshiping God. Uh, and who will allow this uh, thinking, and not just thinking, but these vocalized belief systems that are 100% counter to the scriptures. And you have to just redefine everything to make the scripture in any way say all that stuff and basically cast it off or something like that. So, so they want to live independent of God. What else? They do not want to acknowledge sin uh, in order to seek forgiveness. Now, these are people who've never done anything wrong, if, if you ask them, or at least in their mind, wrong enough to uh, be to, to need to uh, seek God's forgiveness. In other words, uh, when you redefine what sin is, you could get. I can. I can. Oh, it wouldn't be no problem at all. Matter of fact, I've spent a lot of time in my life doing it, uh, declaring, you know, this ain't a sin, that ain't a sin, so there's no need to forgive them. So pretty soon, I get myself in a situation where I really could say I don't ever sin because, you know, I didn't. You know, do something that I deem a sin, whether the Bible deemed that the things I had basically moved over to the other column, right? So this is the way we are. We take the things that God has said are sin and we declare they're not sin. And we also deny the scriptures again, uh, clearly when it says for all have sinned. I, I wonder if people ever realize that Romans in the New Testament. I know because when you mention Old Testament, they go, well, that's old. We don't need that anymore. New Testament's are prevailing. I said, well, Paul was a little confused because he said all have sinned. All. Gentiles, Jews, everybody, Paul and everybody else. The Pope, the preacher down at the Baptist church, everybody sinned. So, and, the, and, and he goes on to say in Romans, again, same book, uh, that, that, that the wages of sin is death. In other words, everybody's sin and everybody's earned the wages of sin, which is death. So what's the solution? That's the idea. That's what Paul was trying to say. Look, get over this part about you're not a sinner. You have. And here's what you earn by that. Little, big, I don't care if your list is two things or a million things. You sin and here's the, uh, here's the wages. So when we don't acknowledge sin because we moved it from a list of sin over to okay things, haven't we really just basically lived independent of God? We're saying, God, you wrote it down in your word. You declared it as sin. You call it over and over again. And by the way, some of this stuff that people just can't believe or won't accept, it's not one little verse in the Bible stuck there. It's a bunch of things. And besides that, when it gets down to all, I mean, what else do you need? Right. And when it, Jesus said, you know, I'm the only way, how many other only ways are there? I mean, you have to redefine, which is what we're doing in the world. We got tired of fighting about it. So now then everybody defines words in their own way. And even the people that are slick, slick people say, well, uh, the context. OK, so in the context of the Bible, God is speaking uh, clearly and concisely and declaratively. And so then what you have to say is the Bible doesn't count. And so therefore, once you take the Bible out of picture, then everything's open. And so you can make your own list up. We might as well throw away a dictionary. Even the dictionary who gives two or three meanings is meaning, giving meanings worth. Those words, why do they have some different meanings? Because they're used in context. But here's the thing. When God says that in context that I'm God and you're not and I'm in charge and you're not and I'm the top of the pile and you're not and I say you sin and I say this and I say that, then you have to say he doesn't count. So you don't acknowledge him. You are actually living independent. My kids, the same as everybody else's kids, I guess, but I won't throw yours under the bus. But mine have offset and I've said, so I won't make them the only ones. I've said I'm not doing that. I don't believe that. I won't listen to you. I'll go do what I want to do. Every time we do whatever we want to, that's what we're doing. So, Lo Ruamah, verse 6, and 
that name is stage two. Stage two says you're not loved. God says, I won't love you because you're not heeding my Jezreel warning. You're not listening to me. You're not sticking out. What does this do in, in, in another sense of our day-to-day -day routine? A person like this who carries this to, the, to a pretty full extent, this person is living life on a one-way street. What does that mean? Living life on a one-way street. Well, one way means you only go this way. So in relationships with each other, interpersonal relationships, relationship, there is this idea of living and I'm the only one who counts. I'm the only one who counts. And when I'm the only one who counts, well, I may pay some lip service to what you're saying. I may, you know, give a little ground. But, but basically, this is all about me. This is something that's been going on before this generation came along. Uh, it's something they called back 20 years ago, the me generation. The me generation says me first. These are the people who cannot be second in traffic, in line, anywhere. Because they, you see, you don't really understand. And some of them are way more polite and, and uh, slick about how they approach that than I am. But here's the thing. You basically say, I'm next. I'm first. And you don't understand. I'm, I've got some real important stuff. In other words, everybody who leaves Fort Walton Beach High School in the morning has go, assumed they're going to work. And they've dropped off their kids who won't ride the bus or they won't let them ride the bus or I don't know what reason. But they've taken this privilege to bring their kids down. Okay, fine. And now then they've got to go to work. Well, everybody on Hollywood, I would, that's, that's probably a broad statement, but I would say 90, 80, 90% of people on Hollywood and in the right the side street, they're right. And other also are going to work at, I go through there about 10 to 7 or 7 or anywhere along there. And any in the other time are going to work too. Just guessing. I'm not sure, you know, what they're out doing that early in the morning. Right? So you're going to work. I'm going to work. Everybody's going to work. And we all are going to get there. And we're all trying to get there on some kind of time schedule. Right? And so how come you're more important than I am so that even though you're entering from a side street, which back in the old days in the driver's manual said you give right away to the main street, that you can just wad up out there, go nose to nose. Same way at the roundabout. Why can't people drive in a roundabout? It's not because they don't know how. Everybody has heard the thing preached to them a hundred times. I live where there's two roundabouts within walking distance of my house. And when you get there, uh, if, there, if the traffic is coming from uh, 98 or if it's let out of the gate, everybody wants to go home. I want to go home too. Or I want to go somewhere. And because it, I'll, the cursed person coming in, this crew of people, a whole lot of them gets one tail to nose to tail. They can go through there like a bicycle chain. In other words, I'm so close to this guy that, you know, I get to go and I'll just run up on them. And how does that work? Well, that's me. That's a me first. That's me. I'm the only one that matters here. The rest of you all do not matter. And the reason you don't is because you don't understand. I've got to get home to do this. I've got to get here to. And they think nobody else has the same issues. And if they do, they don't care. And some, like I said before, some people are nice. I'm not. I'm usually the person who, you know, uh, braids people. You know, it, when I'm when I'm not, when I think I'm supposed to be first, I do that. And when I don't think I'm supposed to be first, I do. In other words, I'm guilty and maybe we all are and nobody wants to admit it. I'll take blame. I'll take that on myself. Life's a one-way street. We do that in relationships to other people. Our desires are more important than anybody else. This is how being a not loved person who doesn't. And by the way, when you don't love people and you don't and they don't love you and you realize this, you get this playing out in your life. Pretty soon it, it falls down all the way down to your own personal interpersonal relationship. And you basically, you know, have no regard for the people. You tolerate them, you accept them to some degree, but you can't stand them. They, they don't understand and, and all that kind of stuff. So, number two, not loved. Not loved is a warning. When you sense that you are not loved, when God says, I don't love you, it means something. Right? It means something. And then we find in verse 7 an interesting thing. Now, notice verse 7. And it takes a while to figure this out. Well, maybe not for you, but it did for me. Verse 7, he says, after he just tells, says this, then what? Yet I will show uh, love to Judah, and uh, uh, and I will say then, not by bow or sword or battle, but or by horses or horsemen, but I, their Lord, their God, will save them. He just said, here's a warning. One, 
Remember, reflect and repent. Didn't do that? Okay, I don't love you. And he says, as our God always is, as I said before, he's always moving. Judgment is always about getting you and I to stop and look up and see where we're drifted off to. See the lines on the road, get back in track, right? So here he says, I, yet I'm going to, I'm going to do, I'm going to do, now this is Judah. So Judah is another southern kingdom. You know, it, Hosea speaking to, is, to Israel, which is the northern kingdom. I know that sometimes you have to keep them all straight and the names float around and I wish they were more, you know, consistent, but that's the way the Bible is. So we go and live with it. We can deal with it. Israel is the 10 tribes to the north. Judah is the two tribes to the south. And basically it had split up and so on and so forth. And of course, historically speaking, looking back over our shoulder, Israel uh, was destroyed in 722 uh, BC, thereabouts, uh, and, and was on the path of destruction down to about 701. And then in 586 BC, which has not happened yet, but these are two times, then Judah becomes wiped out. So the benefit of history says we already know this happened. So God wasn't lying when he said it. So what is the point? Well, this is a warning to Judah and to Israel that if they thought Judah was doing the right thing or if Judah thought they were doing the thing, they wanted to pay attention now. Here, why? What could possibly be happening here? Well, sometimes when God's, we are all guilty of this, and I'll make it about us so we can get to that, right? Because I like to keep it on us, right? Because we like to think we're not them. Matter of fact, that's what Judah was doing. Judah said, well, not us. Obviously, he's going to show mercy to us. Go get them, man. How many times have you said under your breath, or other people said, that was a great message for so-and-so? Or those people really need to hear that. Like, I didn't because I'm got it. I'm good. Bingo. Right? Back to first. Let me out of the parking lot of Fort Walton because I'm first. I got to go to work. You don't understand. It. Right? Uh, let me be in first in line. Let me get ahead of you. Let me jump in there before you. Right? Okay. So, we see God's judgment for other people, but not for us. We're living, in my opinion, right now, we're in a new phase here, a little bit of a new phase, where we got a long list, if you're a Baptist, a Baptist you got a long list of people that you can see in government and all around you who need to have the hammer of God dropped on. So we can get back to living our life happy like we were, right, in a better time. You know, I understand. I understand. I understand that temptation lies out there because we're now getting some concrete, physical, fiscal, and so on, social examples of what was already going on, what people were thinking. In other words, God has has kind of followed up here a little bit with, uh, he kind of stands back and says, okay, you want some of this? Get it. Get you some. You didn't want to follow me. You don't want me. I don't care whether the fiscal responsibility or the financial responsibility is good. I don't care if this person's that or that. If you don't want to, if you want a godless country and a godless nation, then here's what it sort of starts to look like. Here's some of it. Here's a taste of it. Here's a bunch of it. I don't know. I yet to see how that's going to play out. But we got more than we had last month and more than we had two months maybe. But it was already there because our government has basically been on a trajectory to eliminate God from every aspect of our life. Republicans, Democrats, all have been on, a, on that trajectory. Okay, that's what they're shooting for. Uh, it's been going that way since the 60s, if not further back. God is a hindrance. This Christian stuff is, a, is, a, is racist and uh, eth ethnically wrong and it's it's creating all this stuff and so we want it we want that to, so we're going we want some stuff we'd like to do some things we'd like to be and this christian stuff is is killing us so we need to get this out and get rid of it no more prayer at school so on you can see the path okay and that's that's how i see it now how does this work it's a fatal mistake for any people i don't care who you are to start looking around going god needs that they need that judgment not me because the minute you do that, you have said somehow that you have not done it. You don't need to reflect. You don't need to repent of anything. And, and you're in danger of the devil. The devil will seize upon that opportunity. So what happened here? What is this about? If you want to get verse 7, I think it's about this. In 722 B.C., the fall of the northern kingdom, the fall of that, 
was viewed by the quote. Now, this is me saying quote, so I won't make that stupid sign that I'm trying not to do. Quote, righteous. Now, that doesn't mean they're righteous. It means they thought they were righteous. They thought they were righteous. Righteous Judah, right? So righteous Judah says, see, you guys got what you got coming to. You got what you deserve. Be careful when you start saying that. Because during, and why would they say that? How could they think that? How could they think that somehow God uh, did not see any sin in their life? The prophets did not say that. The prophets, Amos and, and Isaiah and others, all pointed out there was plenty of sin to go around, guys. We all need to get straight here. But in 701, you might remember this. It, it's located in the scriptures in Isaiah 37, 36, and, and thereabouts. In that passage, there, Isaiah and Hezekiah prayed because the troops of Assyria had surrounded Jerusalem. Now, Israel, northern kingdom, is gone and never to come back. Ever. And now then, the sins of Judah have have gotten, uh, are starting to catch up with them. And King Hezekiah saw they were surrounded. They were starving to death. They were eating each other. They were doing all kinds of crazy things. Isaiah and both, he and Isaiah both prayed. And, and, and they prayed for relief because the troops were literally at the door, at the door. And you might remember that in God's answer to the prayer, he says, that won't happen, Hezekiah. These things that you are seeing and that you're predicting and are actually going on as far as the beginnings of, this will not happen. T Tonight, I will fix it. Now, notice what God says in verse 7. This is so cool. I hate to let you go by without looking. He says, I will save them. He's talking about Judah. Judah's capital was Jerusalem. So he's talking about Judah, and he says, I will say them what? Not by a bow, which is a weapon of war. Not by a sword, which is a weapon of war. Not by a battle, which is war, right? Fight, fighting. Not by horses and horsemen. He says, I will say them. You may remember, this is a very significant thing. You don't read that. Go back to Isaiah 37 and look down through there. That very night, 185,000 Assyrian troops were camped out around the city, ready to seize the city and take it over and attack it. And, but by the very hand of God, no sword, no battle, no war, no nothing. God killed 185 of them. And the king said, well, I think that was enough for me. We'll just go on back down to where we come from and leave these people alone. Now, folks, I don't know what impresses you or what gets your head around the fact it's one of two things, and this is the way it always comes down to, and I have this conversation with people all the time. Either it's true or it's not. There is no in-between. It's true that without a striking a sword, of, because Hezekiah, Isaiah, and all the people who lived around there and in the city were all witnesses to the fact that nobody left the city to fight the war, but 185,000 people died one night without any visible signs of anything happening to them. And nobody says, I did it. God did it. So you either buy that, you go on with that, you believe that because the Bible says so, or you don't. Same thing. It's, it, I wish I could, I've told people, time, I wish there was some easier way, some simpler, some way for me to get you. You just get it or you don't. You take it all or you don't. God says, I'm all, all or nothing. There's either in or out. You're not somewhere in between. There is no in-between. Nothing. In Bible is never about being an in-between. In-between is a bad place. It's that old saying, straddling the fence. Okay? Don't work. So God brought judgment, and guess what? Judah did not repent. Now they were happy and glad and all that, and they went through some stuff, but they basically did not come back to God and did not dump all the things that God wanted to dump, and you can read all about that. So now then, we're about to verse 8 and 9. So after she weans uh, Lo Ru Ama, Gomer had another son. So now daughter and two sons. The second son, in verse 9, says, The Lord said, Call him Lo Ami. Stage three in judgment, which means not my people. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. You see, whenever we reject God, God rejects us. I know people don't like to hear that. I know there'll be preachers squirming. Anybody watches this, listens to it. Oh my goodness, now then you've really gotten into it. He says, they're not my people. I don't know how you can say that. What does that mean? You ain't mine. My, I had an aunt, really loved aunt, 
who's one of the things she always talked about is her people. What she meant is her kinfolks. You know, they're my, but they're my people. She held on to all of us, no matter how bad we were and how terrible we were. She would always call us our people, and she didn't always agree with it, didn't go along with it, but that we were still her people. God says, you're not my people. It was him who said they are. If anybody gets to say they're not, it's him. He says, you're not my people. It's rejection by God. This is not the people have already rejected God. They've already rejected God. So God says, I reject you. The third stage is rejection by God. God says, no, I'm done. You're out. Forget it. I reject you. You're not my people. That's what that means. There's no mealy mouth in it, no soft settling, no soft peddling it. You're not my people. A separation from the love of God carried out by God. This is not a, this is not something they're doing. They've already rejected God. God says, I reject you and I am making it stick. I'm going to make it stick. In other words, I'm the God who, who could do that to, for Judah, the God who said, all, I'm going to make it stick. I can do that. You can't unstick it yourself. This is the fatal flaw of Adam and Eve. They wanted to get back in. They thought they could, you know, I'm sure that, you know, we don't know what all they thought, but we do know this. People have ever since then have been trying to dig under the wall. We'll get past these flaming sword angels that block in Eden. We'll just dig our way and we'll work our way back in. We'll do a bunch of nice stuff and God will let us. But he'll have to. Matter of fact, some people are already down to the back. He must. He must. We deserve it. So, why could God say this? How could God say this? And why would these people at that particular time, and why should us people today or any other time, get a hold of this? Leviticus 26, 12. Leviticus says, 26, 12, said, God says, I will walk among you and be your God and you will be. They didn't say you're our God. Here, come on, we'll take you on. No, he said, I will be your God and I will. In other words, I'm in charge. I decide where I walk and who I walk among. I'm going to do that. However, verse 13, go on. Verse 13 says, I'm the Lord, your God. In Leviticus 26, I'll just give you these points and you can look at them later. And first, I'll read them out to you because I think it's important. Uh, I'm Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. In other words, I brought you out. Don't, don't forget that. You didn't get out yourself. That you should not be slaves. And I broken the bars of, of your yoke and made you walk away. In other words, I broke your slavery, your bonds, and I set you up. So I'll walk among you. Now, people say, oh, this is great. God's, we're, he, he's got to, no matter what. However, this is like everything else in Scripture. People don't like to read the whole thing, get the whole picture. Verse 14 says, starts with but. When there's a but, you always want to pay attention. It's comparative. It's also contradictory sometimes. So here it is. But if you will not listen to me and will not do all these commandments, and if you spurn my statutes, and if your soul abhors my rules so that you will not do all my commandments, but break my covenant, then I will do this to you. And I just let you read the rest of it. It is terrible. It is tragic. It is sad. It is certain. He says, but if you're not going to do what I want, what I said, then you get this. So God will walk with him. He decided to walk with him. He can decide not to. As parents, parents can decide whether they're going to give in to the children and allow the children to run the rule and do everything they want to do. Or just like we can ourselves. We can decide if we're going to just do whatever we want to do anytime we want to or not. God says, okay, that's fine, but I also get to decide, and I'm deciding that you're not mine. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go with that. I'm not working with that. You're on your own. Remember, separation, rejection. So how's this, how's this look? What does this look like? God says, when I reject you, you will get to, uh, you'll understand the separation that comes. You'll get to experience the weight of your sin. Now, none of us can tolerate the weight of our sin. But we get, we think we've had it all we can take, and there's still more. Because as long as you're alive, you have not experienced the fullness of your sin. Nor, nor have you experienced the complete joy of salvation. Because there's always things mitigating that, right? You also will not be open to, and God says, because I reject you, I'm not going to be open to insincere calls for relief. In other words, uh, I'd just like for you to do this right now, but as soon as I get done, and you don't, we don't, nobody ever says this, but this is what's in their heart. They know it. I know it. I've, my experience, I know how we are, and I've been around enough people 
who just want you to get them out of this hole, but leave them alone the rest of their life. Don't bother them with other stuff. I just want to be out of this hole and then... I'm, no, I'm insincere. I'm not really turning back to you. I'm just looking for a bailout here and now. This is We live in a bailout society, a bailout world. We all just want bailouts, right? So he's not open to that. In matter of fact, in Jeremiah, he says, I won't hear your prayers. Don't pray. Don't talk about it. Don't talk to me. I'm not listening. That's separation from God. Paul said in Romans that in one, I think it's Romans 124, Paul says, look, God gave, we wanted our own way. God will gave us over, gave people over to their own lust and sin. He gave us the chance to feel the full pressure. Most of it, never get the full pressure. Most of the pressure of what we want. We get what you want. To, it also means, separation from God, rejection. It also means to experience the realities of grief. What does that mean? The grief for a loved one. How does that mean? What does that look like? Imagine the parent, as a parent, I try to keep coming back to that because that's something we can, I think we can all get a hold of, is a child who has rejected the parents. Now, we know that death is a, is a is permanent separation and there's grief and, and we could go there. But even when you don't have that, there is rejection. None of us want to be rejected. And parents don't want to be rejected by the children. That's why we, uh, we make the mistake sometimes of caving into them because uh, they, they were trying to, you know, we love them and we still love them, but somehow or other that's not enough. So we have to do something because they tell us that we, they do more or less. What does this look like? Remember when the Bible talks about grieving the Holy Spirit? Paul writes in Ephesians 4, 30 and 32 that we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit. And you're trying to figure out what does that look like? How's that? How, how can it be? Imagine the, the child who rejects the parent. The grieving of the parent. Is that not grieving the parent? Does the parent not, did not want that? The parent was hoping for compliance, acceptance, go on and fix it. No, that causes grief. And so they're grieving the relationship of the parent child. And in Bible says, when we don't do what God wants, then we are grieving the Holy Spirit. And grieving the Holy Spirit can lead to uh, a, uh, a terrible thing. A terrible thing. We can it leads to what what to what 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 how's that look? Well, it leads to such a level that it's unforgivable. What? Wait a minute, I didn't know there was such a thing. I don't think so. We just came from Matthew, didn't we? Let's read Matthew twelve, and I won't read the whole thing, but twenty two thirty thirty seven is a list of things. Jesus is doing some work, and the Pharisees and those are going, Well, you can't be doing that, and you shouldn't be doing that, blah, blah, blah. Down in verse thirty one, uh Jesus says to these group of people that he's that are, are challenging his doing something here, his doing, he says, therefore, he, this of course he's including all this that happened. He said, therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven. But the blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven. And I've had people ask me all kinds of questions about that, and I'm going to go in there today. But I'll tell you this. You can grieve somebody so much. That they no longer hear it. They, they, they harden themselves against it. The Bible says that you grieve the Holy Spirit all the way unto death. In other words, you reject the Holy Spirit. You reject God's call. You reject. We all know the facts are that it gets easier to do the longer you do it. However, we get to the end of our life and we're no longer here. There is no appeal. There is no second chance. There is no nothing. When you've done that, your course is set and you have basically blasphemed God. You said, no, I reject all your offers of salvation, your warnings, and all your things, and therefore I'm uh, now in charge of my life, and there's no longer a grief. The Holy Spirit, then Jesus, God, Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, all those people are saying, all that group is saying, okay, you got that, you wanted this, this is what you got, this is what happens. That's grieving, that's blasphemy. Denying the reality of God has a has a outcome, and ultimately it's hell forever, forever separation from God. So he said, so really, this is what happens. This is the last stage. The last stage is rejection by God. So what can we conclude? For us to say no to God so long, we are no longer able to say yes. That is possible. People get to a place where they have rejected God, rejected God. And rejected. Now, I don't know who you are or who those people are. And I'm saying anybody in this here, but I mean, I don't know. Because I don't know, I don't know. So I don't know means I don't know. And you don't know either. 
That's God's business. But I can tell you this. The reality is that there are there is a possibility that people can will say no, 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 no. That yes becomes impossible. They basically don't think of it. The Bible talks about a hardening of your heart such that you don't hear God. It's not that God ain't talking. You just ain't listening. That's why we don't have people in services, don't come to Sunday school, don't come to churches, because they've already decided that this is not really necessary. And if it was, and if it's even important at all, they don't need it. They can do this. They got this. They got that. Or it's re, it's ridiculous. And they're just going to tell me uh, things that I'm doing wrong, and I know I don't do anything wrong because I haven't sinned, or I'm not really sinning, or I've redefined the things I'm doing as not sin. But those people, they're sinning. They're all sinning up there. They're all sinning. But I'm I don't need it. So if you ain't sinning, you don't need nothing. You don't need it. Next thing you know, boom, there they are. They're living on a one way street. They don't think so. They think because they march. They think because they do this. They think because they're nice. They send a couple of bucks to this charity and that charity. They smile at people they don't like. And they do all these things that somehow they're not sinning and they're fine and it's all good. And God will take all that and go, well, you know, after all, I mean, oh, geez. Oh, well, okay, come on. You can do what I told you you can't do. You don't have to pay. There is no consequences. It was a joke. I was just trying to, but you clearly aren't going to do it. So I guess I'll just give it because after all, I made you. And, you know, so they think that's how God is. A, some sort of sentimental old soul. That's the God they need. That's the God they make. And when, when God says, I retain, they don't buy that. They say, that's preacher talk. God don't do that. They ignore the passage of the Bible, ignore what God says. So they say, it. but this was the condition of Hosea's day. Spiritual and moral uh, life in Hosea's day was this. They basically had decided they had said no to God so long they couldn't distinguish. They wouldn't distinguish. They weren't interested. So today, how's that look? I'm going to give you an example, and I'm sorry if this offends anybody on here or here or whatever. And I don't, you know, I don't know. But it was the first example that came online, a really obvious one that just happened. Let me, let me say what I'm talking about, then I'll give you an example. One's personal piety. Now, piety is not a word Baptists use very much, so let me tell you what it means. It's some sort of, you know, piety is this idea of, uh, of, of holiness or godlikeness or this idea that we're trying to be pious. You know, that's kind of what you talk about. You know, you, you picture, you know, people going around like, oh. or the, the padre with the stuff or the guy with the special clothes. and He's very pious. You know, he never says bad words. He never does anything bad. Mm, and, he, and he talks to you with his hands in the Father Mike mode right here. Like, oh, yes. Mm -hmm, yes. And whenever he gives advice, just like all TV preachers. And TV preachers, by the way, on, on television, the only good ones are all, all the ones that are portrayed as somewhat good are, are the basically the Catholics. And no offense to Catholics. But it's the fact. Just watch it. They give you advice without consequences. They may throw a few consequences out there. But, hey, you know. Doesn't doesn't come off as you nailed down or anything like that, and they you know, right? So any anyway, so piety, so personal piety, your personal piety, your personal piousness, your personal view of your own religiosity, if you will. This idea is uh, is often separated from the responsibilities of Christian living. Christian living is a re a life of responsibility. A life of repentance on a daily basis, an hourly basis, a minute by minute basis. A life of recognizing humility because we ain't better than them. We just we're just willing to admit to God that we ain't. And God says, "I knew that already, and thank you for that." So hey, I'll forgive you. Now try to do better. And you, so you don't have no up and down. You're not uppity on them. You basically know you're living a, a, a saved life, not a sin free life. And that you have you have to treat other people. With respect, but you understand that, that that they have to respond to God too. You don't you don't hold that. You're not the in and out guy. That's God's business. But you also realize that they're not in. If they're not in, if they own all these things that I've been talking about and lots of things that people do. Then they can, they are inconsistent. You're the person. Just say, and I I'm not sorry, bore it out, but I gotta say it. You're the person who says two plus two equals four, not two plus two equals anything you want it to be, which is what the world would love to hear. Okay, so. In other words, you, you, you know, you recognize that they have a different view than you do, but it ain't right because it's inconsistent with the Bible, the whole Bible and all the Bible anyway. So you're, you have a responsibility to live a Christian life, whether the rest of the world is or any other person, the whole, just like Jesus had to do what he had to do, no matter if nobody listened to him and nobody believed him and nobody, him, he did what the father wanted to do because that was his 
responsibility. We individually have responsibility to do what God wants to do, which is take him at his word, which is there, and live it. And whether anybody else does or not, we cannot go. But you know that person, them people down there at that church, you know, but, uh, but, but that don't work. Okay, so. And we're not allowed to use our efforts to do that as a basis of self-justification or resistance to judgment that we see other people going through or we realize. In other words, we don't get to say like Judah, well, you guys deserved it up there. I knew it was going to happen. I went, you know, and, and all the time it's the, 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 you know, we don't see the drift in our own life. This is a big mistake. So our piety cannot lead us down that road. That's not what it should be. So what's my example? Sorry, I hate it, but I got to have to say it. The president went down to his church. The president went down there with a the crew, his crew, his gang, and he prays, or whatever they're doing down there. He has a picture of him praying and going through the, the motions of the Catholic service. He's doing it. Now, I say going through the motions because the president was down there praying. I don't know. I didn't time it, but there were several minutes. While those several minutes were going on, this very same president and those who backed him and those and those who were with him, the ones especially the, the vice president, have supported and continue to support the killing of babies. And there's many other things they're supporting. I promise you there's plenty of other stuff to pick on. That's one. And so while he was down there, thousands or a few thousand of American children were being aborted with his uh, okay and his approval. Even though the church he goes to does not approve of it and cl claims it's counter. And he's down there praying. Everybody's saying, boy, this, look how pious he is. Look how we hadn't had a president like that ever. Oh, that's a lie. And the fact is, there's really a pious president. Some of them more serious and sincere than those, I suppose. I don't know. I'm not judging him. But I'm saying he's not the first to go into a church and pray while supporting things that were absolutely 100 percent, 100, 1,000, zillion percent against what the Bible teaches today, yesterday, and tomorrow because God doesn't change. How pious. How ridiculous and how hypocritical is that? Wow. That is a pious self-justification uh, resistance to the judgment of God. And that's just one. I could pick several other things that he supports and others do and not just him, but he's the man. He's the head of the top. He's at the top of the pile right now. And that's, and that's clearly stated. It's not an if or guess or maybe or waffle. So, People feel like if they believe in Christ or they believe in God or something and pray their prayers and participate in church activities, that's what he was doing, they have become good Christians and have fulfilled all their obligations. What a lie from the pit of hell. Absolutely not. None of that. Insincere. These people in Hosea's day and all these other days in between have been going down to temple, doing their thing, doing this, doing that, and everywhere else. And ever since then, it ain't nothing new. And they are all insincere. God says, I am so sick and tired of this. I am fed up to here. I warned you one. I warned you two. Now you got three. Separation. Now, they don't notice that because they don't believe in the God who does. They don't think that's what God would do. They've already defined God in a different way and they've taken him. And so basically they reject him and there it is. Do they, would they hear it? Never. Now, why, what, 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 what can each one take? I'm going to give you one takeaway. And I want you to think about this because I know this is going to be hard. We must not be too quick to try to remove the weight of judgment of God from people or ourselves. What does that mean? You see, as parents, we grieve when our children reject us and say they don't like it and we've done something that's limited them in some way or brought some sort of judgment on them. I don't know a parent that's worth his while. Now, that don't mean there aren't some, but there, I don't know a good one who doesn't hurt whenever they have to withhold or bring meet out punishment of some sort that's reasonable within limits. It, there ain't none anymore, no limits. But anyway, there's no reasonableness to it. But anyway, when we did it, when I was a kid, and you understand. So then we don't like it. It's not something we wanted to do, but we're doing it for the greater good. And to withhold it is not good. And so when we, as Christians, immediately jump to, oh, you poor thing, God has been hard. You know, you did this, but God had to bring something to but I tell you what we're doing. We're going to jump right into love and mercy and get you out of this. Because the mercy of God will already. So what does that tell him? 
Not that bad of a deal. Didn't hurt that bad. Wasn't much, wasn't much to that. Wasn't much consequences to that. So guess what? No change. Insincerity plays. We remit, we lead them out. We, we are less sincere. It's real, it, real repentance never happens unless you really feel like you have to. I, I mean, I can tell that personally. You have to make a change. When you see that it's absolutely necessary is when most of us does it. That will lead to long-term health and salvation. That leads it. Listen to me. This is going to be the last line. We all would be better off with the limp of Jacob or the stigmata of Christ. Now, if you don't know what the limp of Jacob is, then you go back and read your Bible, look it up. If you don't know what stigmata is, I'll tell you because it's a Greek word that we've Englishized and it means mark. Paul spoke of the mark in Galatians of the marks of Christ, the stigmata. He wore in his body the marks of Christ. What is he talking about? The nail prints. Remember Jesus when he came back, he still had the nail prints. I did that. It really happened. And I look at that and I remember that scar. The limp of Jacob reminded him of God. We all would do better with a limp or a mark. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, this morning I thank you for your patience and for your mercy as you give us your word this morning. Thank you, Father, for your people. Thank you, Lord, this morning that as we all face the reality of our own sinfulness and our own uh, independence, we realize, Lord, this morning we humble ourselves before you and ask you to forgive us for those who know you not as their Lord and Savior, in, uh, whether they say they do, but they don't. We pray for them. We pray that they would this morning. They would take up your opportunity offer before it becomes too late. We pray, Lord, we would give a good witness and that we would show that we believe what we say. We pray, Lord, for all these things this morning and pray your will be done in our life, in my life, in the life of others, as you have laid out, that we might experience the joy of salvation and the gift of forgiveness and eternal life. We ask these things in Jesus' name.